Let us now read God's word in Romans chapter 7. We'll read the whole of Romans 7. (coughs) Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Amen. Let us read together Lord's Day 2 of the Heidelberg Catechism. Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 2. 
here we begin the first part of the misery of man. Whence knowest thou thy misery? Out of the law of God. What doth the law of God require of us? Christ teaches us that briefly in Matthew 22. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first and the great commandment. The second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. With respect to their moral imperatives, I may add. Canst thou keep all these things perfectly? In no wise, for I am prone by nature to hate God and my neighbour. People of God, you must know your misery. I, as the preacher this morning, want you to know your misery. I'm being very explicit. The office bearers in this congregation want that for you too, because this is the will of Jesus Christ, the Lord of heaven, he wants you to know your misery. And therefore I say to you, without fear of contradiction, and specifically with regard to you, as to your new man, you want to know your misery too. You want to know what it is and what it isn't, though you have a pretty good idea what it is and what it isn't. But you need to hear it, and it needs to be sharp. Knowing your sins and misery, knowing our sins and misery, helps us to identify our enemies correctly. It enables us to be more concerned with the things about which we must be more concerned, and most concerned. And it puts the lesser concerns in their proper place. And you, that is to say, we, need to know our sins and misery because we understand that our comfort is tied up with it. We looked at that last week. We confessed on the Lord's Day previous to this that our only comfort in life and death is that we do not belong to ourselves, but unto our faithful Saviour, Jesus Christ. We confess, therefore, too, that our comfort depends on knowing our sins and misery, and upon knowing our deliverance in Jesus Christ, and upon knowing the way in which we express our gratitude. We want to know our sin and misery because we understand that though that's misery, it leads to something better and it's necessary for us. This new section, the first part of the misery of man, comes first because of the experiential approach of our Heidelberg Catechism. Logically, we must know our sins and misery before seeking deliverance from them. And we must know our deliverance before we can show gratitude for that salvation. So our misery comes first, leading us to our deliverance in Jesus Christ and then to our gratitude. That's why it's first. And the section on misery is not only first, but shortest, because the main theme of our catechism is comfort alone in Jesus Christ the Lord. So the treatment of deliverance, both as to its accomplishment and the life 
and substitutionary death of the Son of God and then its application to us with that same Christ who earns this salvation conveys it to us by the Holy Spirit that's going to receive a deep and detailed treatment and of course our thankfulness to the life of gratitude which flows from those who have received this great deliverance that's going to be expanded upon our misery comes first and is shortest therefore as the sort of dark backdrop the foil against which we view our redemption and the life of gratitude which flows from it so though our misery is briefly stated in lord's days two three and four it is certainly clearly sharply stated because it's there as i've been saying to serve the message of our salvation in jesus christ alone and the life which pleases god in jesus for the redeemed and the called let's look this morning at knowing our misery knowing our misery what it is to know our misery how we know our misery and why we must know our misery knowing our misery what it is how we know it and why we must know it if i were to go out with a clipboard though i have no intention of doing as you understand and ask a random sample of the population what is your misery i might get all sorts of strange probably bemused startled angry responses but in terms of answers a school child might say misery for me is staying in and doing schoolwork when it's bright and sunny outside and i just want to go out and play a motorist in normal times might say that misery is getting stuck in a queue traffic jam for a quarter of a mile when you have an important appointment to make misery misery for a third is being stuck in a low paying unsatisfying job with very little security horses and other i'd take that gladly i'm unemployed misery for others is not knowing where their next meal comes from and having their belly swollen because of the famine for other people they experience misery in that they need daily injections of morphine because of the excruciating pain with which they live now all of those things are to varying degrees miserable some of course are more serious than others none of them would happen in a sinless world because in all all of them in various ways come through sin our own sin or someone else's sin or this sin cursed world under god's judgment where nothing works perfectly about which solomon said vanity of vanities all is vanity a grasping after the wind but none of these things and with a bit more time we're going to quote a whole host of other things i suppose none of these things are the essential and central misery they're only the effects of misery or ways in which we experience its effects sin is the heart of misery and here we tie this in with what we saw last week comfort 
is belonging to Jesus Christ. And misery, therefore, is sin, because sin is that which separates from God, as Isaiah 59, verse 2 says. Comfort, that's knowing Christ, belonging to him. And misery is sin. And just as there's one comfort, our only comfort, belonging to Jesus Christ, so there is one misery, sin. Psalm 32 teaches us that our misery includes the guilt of unconfessed sin. We looked at this psalm probably a few months ago now. You'll remember it, I trust. This would be a good psalm to sing with your family after this service. But whether you were there for that sermon or not, you may well know what Psalm 32 deals with. David's bones waxing old all the day. His moisture being turned into the drought of summer. And then, as it were, not having enough water, he gives another image like that of drowning. Too much water. The floods of water encompassing him. And what God did to David as a lesson for us all in Psalm 32 was he made David feel the misery of his sin. He made him miserable because of the unconfessed transgressions. David felt like a man who had aged 50 years overnight with all the pains and the aches that brings. A man who is panting for water with his tongue hanging out. A man who felt himself to be drowning flapping his arms to keep his head above water, afraid of going under. And the Christian, to varying degrees, experiences this when he becomes like a beast, Psalm 32 says, and stubbornly refuses to get down on his knees and confess his evil way and to turn to the Lord with contrition of heart. The misery of our sins includes the misery of unconfessed sin and we need to get rid of that unconfessed sin and admit our evil ways and feel that burden being lifted. Do that, beloved. Our misery, and now we're especially moving from Psalm 32 to Romans 7, which we read earlier, our misery includes our doing evil. And when I say our, I don't mean the hour of the human race. I mean the hour of Christians. Oh, you are. We do evil. The evil which I would not, that I do, says the Apostle Paul in Romans 7. The misery of actively performing wickedness. And not only the misery of unconfessed sin as a heavy burden and a load upon us. And this is misery too because Romans 7 rightly teaches us that we do these sins as something which we, according to the new man, detest. What I hate, that I do. That's misery, doing what you hate. And then comes the second misery, the feeling of guilt. Our misery, Romans 7 speaks of this as well, also includes the inability, the utter inability of ourselves to do anything that is good in the sight of God. So our misery is 
doing evil and the lack of ability to do the good. And the believer says that my sin and misery is such that outside of the grace of God, I only and ever sin. Which incidentally shows the folly of the Arminian and heretical view that man has this supposedly free will that he's able to choose the good. No, he's not. He's totally depraved. And even as Christians, our misery is that though the old man is principally defeated and no longer dominant and reigning in us, he is still present and he is still totally evil without any ability even to desire the good. That's our sin, which is our misery. And for the Christian too, and Paul also speaks of this in Romans 7, our misery includes our becoming captive to the flesh when we sin. Paul says in verse 23, that our doing evil and not doing good, quote, brings me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Brings me into captivity. The Christian can also experience bondage, the bondage of sin. It's not the bondage of sin of an unbeliever whereby he is enslaved to sin and does not care doesn't will to escape. It's the bondage of a man who has tasted liberty and has been made free and enjoyed that liberty, but then through his own sin gives himself over to some degree and for some time as a prisoner, being trapped in a wicked way or lifestyle for a time and being of himself completely unable to get out of it. But ultimately God will deliver him through the difficult way of repentance. But his captivity is still bondage and it's experienced as such for that time. Misery. If we ask, what is it to know this misery? Well, it's not just the sort of superficial thing that the world does and that we can fall into doing too. Well, not a perfect world, is it? That's not knowing our misery. Is there anybody who believes that this is a morally perfect world? Even the pagan religions, even the godless philosophies, they all believe there's something wrong in the world. The issue is what is wrong and what is the solution? That's where people differ and all sorts of philosophies and religions are substituted for the truth of God in Jesus. Knowing our misery isn't either knowing that other people have sinned, that they're wicked, okay? So the world's out of kilter and others are, are sinful. Yeah, yeah. But what about knowing our own sin and misery? That's what the catechism's driving at and that's what the Bible focuses on. That's saving knowledge. Knowing our own personal sin and misery isn't either, well, knowing that I don't feel too good today or that I am experiencing more than the normal for me, whatever that may be, hardships. Or even that I'm not perfect and I wouldn't claim that I keep the laws of God completely. The knowledge of our sin and misery goes far deeper 
and is much more personal than the sort of things I've just been mentioning. It's knowing and therefore confessing that I have sinned against God's authoritative and perfectly good law. And that I have sinned not merely as some aberration whereby I say, well, this is out of character for me. This is a one-off. I don't know what made me do it. But I sin because me, I, as to the flesh, am evil. I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. That's Romans 7 verse 18. And I know that without the grace of God, I never did a single good thing in my entire life. And I could live to be as old as Methuselah without ever doing a good thing before God. What does the Catechism say? I am prone by nature to hate God and my neighbour. That's knowing oneself. Because of this, since God is holy... I confess, I shake too about it, that I am worthy of being damned in hell because of my sins. And not everybody is willing to confess their sins. They don't see it like that at all. They shrink back from it. But it's only those who know their sins and misery who ever find deliverance in Jesus Christ. What if I were to say that knowing our sin means that we accuse ourselves of being wretched? Is that going too far? Is that a, the sort of thing that a healthy Christian would say of himself? Or is that the ramping of a deranged religious enthusiast well, here was Paul who was accused once much learning hath made thee mad and he rightly explained that he isn't mad and that he's in his right mind speaking words of sobriety and truth but here's Paul a man who had made great progress in the Christian life and knew what it was to follow Jesus and he said oh wretched man that I am O oh, wretched man that I am he's not saying that he was wretched before he trusted in Jesus on the Damascus road he's speaking of himself now O oh, right wretched man that I am This confession of Paul is in keeping with the confessions, let's say, of Abraham in the Bible. I'm just dust and ashes before God. Or Isaiah. Woe is me. I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. Mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Or Job. Job, who said he has now seen the Lord. And he repents him of all the foolish things that he said. My sin makes me worthy of the wrath of God. And I know that I am unclean and wretched thereby. Now if one asks the question, how is it that we know this? Then we bring up the issue of a standard, a standard that shows sin. The standards of this world do not show us sin. We could play, though it's more serious than that, but we could play a sort of a word game here. The Bible says adultery, the world says affair. The Bible says fornication, the world says Free love, depending at what time, or just having some fun. 
The Bible says sodomy. The world says alternative lifestyle. The Bible says lying. The world says being economical with the truth. The Bible says Sabbath breaking. The world says leisure time. Or if they want to be really pious, I'm having more time with my family. And then the world identifies good things as bad, just like Isaiah 5 says. Smacking your children when they misbehave and because you love them and you don't want to see them walk in the ways of sin, that's, that's cruelty. That's cruelty. Cruelty. It just shows how much you hate your children and you're abusing your children. Although it never did any of us any harm. But the modern man is so wise, so wise. And when you look at the children that are being produced, in the state school systems and so forth, you say to yourself, boy, they're doing such a great job. Telling someone that what they believe in their false religion is wrong, oh, that's, that's, that's horrible. That's, that's hateful. And sin, sin's a bad word too. This from the world that uses all sorts of bad world, words, filthy, foul language. But a word like sin, that's, that's part of the offensive. It's socially unacceptable behavior. Okay. My point now is, if these are the standards that function in your mind, well then, no one will ever be found a sinner. I mean, a sinner before God. No one. Because according to those standards, there really isn't any sin. It's just a social construct that the powers that be use to try and keep us in check and funnel us in certain ways that they like. But no one will ever be found to be a sinner with these standards. And that is exactly the point. The standards are not designed to show what's righteous and what's unrighteous, to show what's sin and to humble us before the God who made us it's a substitute standard. I'm as good as everybody else. We're all pretty decent people. The standards of the world don't show us sin and they don't show us misery either. The world has two main methods here. The first of which is that it tries to avoid thinking about misery. There are certain people, and this is their, their style, their personality. So there are millions spent on entertainment and amusements and games and fun and excitement. And so for many people, the idea of misery is an unpopular one. And if you feel misery, go away and drown your sorrows with a jar of eel. And don't worry, be happy. And that's... That's about as shallow as it gets. That's, oh, that's all they've got, isn't it? Oh, dear. So for some, it's a sort of a denial. Put your head in the sand and just, just forget about it. And for others, these two aren't mutually exclusive. They can operate together. For others, it's more of a sort of a substitution. My misery isn't what God says. It isn't sin. My misery is that I've got a lot of debt. And my neighbor has a, a better motorbike than I do. And my wife nags me too much. Or my husband's lazy. That's my misery. And if anyone comes to you, and you think like this and tells you about God and how we must all die. This world has a meaning. We're here for a purpose. And talks about a better way. The way of life found in Jesus. Well then such a person is to be ridiculed and mocked. And all this talk about sin. A person probably needs psychiatric help. And he's maybe struggling with bad self-esteem. and All of these things to keep people off the real issue. And it's not just the world out there that has these mechanisms 
defense mechanisms, but even our own standards. We imbibe this, we do it naturally from the flesh, and we suck it in from the ungodly world. We apply to ourselves the wrong standards because we want to protect ourselves, protect ourselves from feeling bad and confessing our own sins. That's the way we operate. And we compare ourselves with ourselves and with other people, just like Second Corinthians 10 forbids us from doing. And then we conclude that we're not really bad people and we just deceive ourselves. And if one really wants to know, as you want to know, child of God, the real standard that shows us sin, it's the Word of God. Whence knowest thou thy misery? Out of the law of God. The Ten Commandments, which forbid us from having all other gods and all other things in which we place our trust, from worshipping God any other way than he tells us in the Word, law of God which requires that we keep our oaths we remember the Sabbath day we honor our parents we're faithful in our marriage and chaste and that we don't kill steal tell lies or covet that standard I just mentioned the key words Gave even a shortened form of the Ten Commandments as a summary purpose. That standard applied to the what we think and the way we think and what we say and do shows us that we are sinful and polluted. And then, then we read in Romans, I had not known sin but by the law. 7 verse 7. By the law is the knowledge of sin. Romans 3 verse 20. And the Catechism says, what does the law require of us? Later on, it's going to list the Ten Commandments in the section on thankfulness. Here, it quotes the words of our Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 22. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and soul and mind and strength and love your neighbour as yourself. And if the law can be more easily treated superficially that's what the rich young ruler did though Jesus loved him and therefore converted him brought him to repentance that's what the sorrow of departure for a time indicates the rich young ruler, he said, all these things have I kept from my youth up. He was deceived. But love is a tougher test because it speaks of our inward heart affection. It's funny though that our world, which gets so much wrong, doesn't like law but likes love. But it doesn't actually understand that love is even a higher standard than law. If someone asks you with regard to your wife, well, do you, do you tell your wife lies? I expect that you're able to say yes. Do you steal from your wife? What would I be doing stealing from my wife? Do you lead your wife in the scriptures? Yes, we, we do our devotions. We read the word. Do you love her? Is she precious? Well, that gets harder. And then we begin to think, think that we're selfish. Jesus could have come to Peter. And he did ask questions like this too. But he could have come to Peter after he denied him three times. Peter, have you repented of denying me? Peter, are you willing to preach the gospel? 
But what he actually asked him, in John 21 is, Peter, do you love me? And the Christian confesses that of himself, I am prone by nature to hate God and my neighbour. Prone by nature. Nature simply means what I am. What I am as a fallen human being means that that's what I naturally, instinctively do. O oh, wretched man that I am. And in this chapter, Romans 7, the Apostle Paul teaches not merely that we know our sins by the law, which law, he's going to say in chapter 13, is summed up in love. But here Paul also makes the point that we know our misery while trying to be good. That's when we experience our depravity most. Someone could say, yeah, yeah, I, I sort of keep the commandments more or less. And yeah, I don't love as much as I should do. But, but now, now go and do that. Go and keep the commandments and love. And then we find that it's a bit maybe like ice skating where it looks easy, but when you try and do it, speaking now as someone who's not an ice skater, you realise it's a lot harder than what it appeared. Well, Romans 7 says that. It says that our sin and misery are especially experienced that when we're trying, when we are trying to please the Lord. Verse 21, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil, is present with me. And it was after experiencing and reflecting upon that titanic struggle that the apostle cried out, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Do you know this? The Christian does. The law condemns me. I don't love God the way I should. That's my misery. I hate that. And I'm wretched. Even as a Christian, according to the flesh, that's what I, after the old man, am. And I feel that. The unbeliever, you see, doesn't know, and by definition, cannot have the triple knowledge. He doesn't know deliverance in Jesus. Therefore, he can't truly be thankful because at the start of that threefold knowledge, the knowledge of sin and misery isn't there. The Redeemer doesn't really make sense. Gratitude for deliverance? Well, I don't really need that much of a deliverance. I'm not that bad. To relate Lord's Days 1 and 2 of our Catechism, it's the man who confesses my only comfort in life and death is that I belong to my faithful Saviour, Jesus Christ, Lord's Day 1. He's asked, Whence knowest thou thy misery? And he answers, Out of the law of God. God has taught me this by his law. And he has revealed it in my heart and mind through faith by the Holy Spirit, the saving knowledge. Let's move on lastly, more briefly, to our third, final point, why it is that we must know our misery. You'll understand here that there, are, there is a, a perverse and even a sinful way of speaking about our sin and our misery. There are some probably a dying breed, at least in our day, but it's still, still there, I suppose. Some people who boast in their lowliness, they're very humble, very humble. And you've heard probably the sort of pseudo-pious ejaculations. Oh, I feel such a bad sinner. There's nobody as bad as me. 
if only you knew what a sinner I was, and then you're supposed to come in and say, oh, you're not that bad, you're a pretty nice person. But of course, if you then agree with them and say, yeah, yeah, you're the worst Christian I've ever seen, you're just a despicable person, I can't, can't understand how wicked you are, and then the person will become outraged, and then we may realize that we're just dealing with Phariseeism and, and hypocrisy. There are some people, and they speak about sin and misery, or perhaps things related to that, and you think that the goal is really just to depress other people and bring them down. That they're miserable and they want to make other people miserable too, because miserable, misery loves company. And then we can say, you know, just like the argument in Romans 2, maybe I do that too. Maybe I do that too. And then we realize that there's this third category too, and maybe we fall into it as well. Well, Some people who talk about their sin and misery, and really it's an excuse for avoiding doing what they know they ought to do. It's no wonder I disobey. See, I'm a sinner. So that's it. I'm, I'm excused for my bad behavior but that's exactly the opposite of the way that David argues in Psalm 51 after his most famous sin when David said that he was conceived and born in sin and his point isn't well I did all these things but what do you expect that's the way I was made I came into the world a sinful person so please excuse me David's argument is instead, I did this, and I did this because I'm evil inside me. I'm depraved and wicked of myself, which makes it worse. Now we could sing the opening few verses of Psalm 51 after this sermon too. Another appropriate spiritual song. There is a righteous and good motivation for seeking to know and knowing our misery. It's not a knowledge of one's misery for its own sake. The Catechism is really clear here. This triple knowledge, knowing our sins and misery, leads us to Jesus Christ for deliverance. Jesus said that he did not come to call the righteous, people who think they're good. He said that he came to call sinners, people who know they're not good, but that they're evil, to call sinners to repentance. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, Galatians 3 teaches. And then we come to the cross where we know the forgiveness of sins and we know sanctification. Principally, we die to sin in union with Christ and we grow. We grow. Those who know their sin know comfort and deliverance and those who deny their sin cannot know that comfort and salvation in Jesus Christ. This is a test when we think about our sin or misery. Does it make us moan? Does it make us boast? Or does it drive us to Jesus? That shows it to be genuine. And then in driving to Jesus, does it ultimately, although misery in itself, does it ultimately actually make us comforted and joyful and thankful? Then we know that that's that's a good, healthy knowledge, an appropriate knowledge, because if we are sinners, and we are, then it's right to know ourselves as such and deal with it the biblical way, faith in Jesus. That's Paul's point at the end of Romans 7, verse 24. O wretched man that I am, 
Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? The body of this death, wretched man. That's knowing his sin and misery. Then he adds, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's the deliverance. The act of God, God acting in Jesus Christ. His holy life, his atoning death, bearing our sins, bringing us pardon. And I'm comforted that I belong to him. And then there's that other word in that part I read, I thank God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I thank God. That's the third part of the Catechism. That's our knowledge, our saving knowledge. And it's knowing these three things, my sin and misery, deliverance in Jesus Christ, and the way of showing gratitude that brings us the comfort of the gospel, struggle of the Christian life, but consolation in the arms of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for thy word. It shines a spotlight upon us. It reveals to us our sins and miseries. Help us not to flinch, but to behold it. In the night, in that light, in the light of our darkness, to go afresh to Jesus Christ. Pardon us, Lord God, give us strength. Enable us not to give up, to faint, to fear, to fall away. And be with us this Lord's Day. Care for our families, that together we may grow in grace through the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.